triumphant. We are all gathered at the same table. We will have communion next week, and uh, we are inviting those who have uh, passed from our church family uh, to send uh, pictures of their loved ones, and we will connect with them in the service. For those who are joining us online, you will be invited at a time to share as well, and we will be lifting up those as well uh, in our country who have lost loved ones to COVID. Uh, in the midst of this time, there is a God who holds us all together. For jo so join us uh, next Sunday at, at 9.15 for that service. If you are not able to be here for communion and don't feel comfortable with that, after the service at 11 o'clock, or excuse me, 12 o'clock, from 12 to 1, uh, we will have drive-through communion on the side of the church here. Come and join us, and we'd be happy to share uh, from the table with you. Uh, a couple of things, just uh, take a look through our small groups. We've got a lot of small group ministries that are starting and are ongoing. Uh, actually, tonight, for those who uh, are interested, and uh, there's a number of us that are joining this, Monroeville Interfaith Ministerium is having a conversation on race with white fragility, talking about that. Um, there is still, I think, spaces available. You can just check on the MIMS Care, M I M C A R E S, MIMSCare.org, and uh, you can sign up for that there. Uh, we have our Seekers Group on Monday nights, Faithful and Inclusive uh, group that will be meeting uh, on Wednesday mornings here in person and afternoon online, and also Thursday morning Bible study with uh, Dave Quell. Uh, all of that information is there in the email blasts, or you can just give a call to the office, be happy to direct you. And in addition to that, another small group coming up is is our young adult dialogue on racism that uh, Amanda Gilligan, our uh, director of discipleship, will be leading. That's coming up on November 4th. And so all that information is there for you. <sighs> One last thing, <laughs> and that is about mission. Uh, this is a time where there are many who are in need. And there are a couple of options that are there to make a direct difference right away uh, today. One is our Encore our United Methodist Committee on Relief. They are there at the fires, both in California, out on the West Coast, and they are working with people to help them find support during this time. And also they're with those who have been uh, recuperating from the hurricanes. And so every gift and dollar you give, because our administrative costs are covered by the church, goes directly to them. You can give either online uh, and designate that or here, uh, designate your gift. Also, there's a little piece in there uh, this, this week, which I think is cool. It's uh, pick a bag uh, and give thanks for giving. Uh, that's being done by our adult ministries. If you look there, there's a listing each day through the month to put something in a bag or a box, and then on the 15th of November, bring that here, and we will take all that to the uh, uh, Garden City uh, United Methodist Church Food Pantry that feeds all the way through the Monroeville area and uh, uh, make sure that they're well-stocked coming up for the holiday season and the winter that's coming. So uh, take a look at that online. I think it's a great idea. If you're not with us, if you're online in a different part of the country, uh, I still think it's a great thing to do, look for your local food pantry, put that bag together and box together and take it down to them. So wonderful ways that we can be faithful. And with that, we're here to worship. Are you ready to worship? Yes, that's a lot of stuff to hear already. You haven't even gotten to the worship service. If you don't, please rise and join us in our call to worship. And mercy. We gather to name our sorrow and share new visions. We gather to heal our pain and rekindle our hope. We gather because the journey is long. We gather because we hunger and thirst for a new heaven and a new earth. The spirit of life has called us to be together. The spirit of compassion has called us all, the spirit of compassion has called all of creation to be transformed by love. May this gathering serve to strengthen, encourage, and renew us. Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let me get these together. Uh, you may be seated if you wish, and just open your heart in praise as we remember the holy gift of God's love. Stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How 
great, how awesome is He? And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. God's children said, Amen. Amen. Our centering scripture this morning is from the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, a very familiar scripture. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offering? with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus from the sinners, the one who strays so far away.
Break our hearts for what breaks your hearts. come now in the attitude of prayer. And as we do, we're mindful of those who are in need, and there are many around us in this COVID time. We are also aware of the many who are celebrating. We've had a number of births in the congregation here. And the ways we celebrate, the way we see God reaching through others to reach out in need in the middle of this time. And so as we gather together, I'd like to lift up a couple of uh, concerns uh, as, we, uh, as we gather. Uh, we cannot share all uh, names online, so what we've decided to do is actually just read first names. I think that's a way of doing that, and that way of not, and, uh, lifting up those who we've been praying for here at the church. And at the same time, uh, lifting up those, if, uh, as I uh, set out a, a, a group of people, if there are those who are wrestling with those issues that you know of, uh, you can pray for them in this time as well. We lift up for those who are grieving. And there are many who have lost loved ones uh, here in the church and also around our country, uh, especially those who have lost loved ones due to COVID. We pray for them. We pray for those who are in the hospital. Uh, we pray for Gary. Uh, we pray for Trudy. Uh, we pray for our medical uh, first line doctors, nurses, techs, all of those who are working for healing. We lift up those in medical need uh, through our congregation, through our community, through our country, through our world. We lift up Peggy. We lift up the families who are battling with COVID. We lift up Gloria. We lift up those who are recuperating from surgeries and we celebrate the gift of medicine and the way you, O oh Lord, come in and touch lives and bring healing. We lift up Susie and Beth and Lynn and Jan. We think of those who are just simply in need of prayer. Some are dealing with struggles of, of uh, anxiety and stress and senses of hopelessness. Some are dealing with physical ailments, broken relationships, recuperating. 
those in need of prayer. In our congregation, we lift up Lynn and Bob, Brian and Vi, Marlene. We lift up Allison. We lift up Chris. And those in our hearts beyond our knowing. We lift up those who are wrestling with losses of jobs and support. Those who are wrestling, who were furloughed or laid off. And we pray for support and a way forward that in the middle of this time they would find whatever they needed in terms of food and shelter and protection. We pray for those who are dealing with oppression and judgments and, and racism and that they would feel your presence with them, surrounding them, reminding them that you are, that they are loved and be loved by you, your son, your daughter, your friend. We pray for our police and for our public servants who are seeking to keep people safe and, and helping us to uh, find protection in the midst of all that is going up around us. For their protection, for your guidance, for your grace as they seek and lay down their lives and risk them for ours. We lift up prayers for your church all around the world. That in the midst of this time of upheaval we might see your grace, that we might be your salt, that people might feel your love in us, strengthen us, that we would shine with your light and be your salt. As we pray now, we lift up this prayer hymn, O Lord, hear my prayer. And we ask in this time that you would come and that we would open to feel your presence, your grace, your peace and guidance. Gracious God of justice, God of salvation, we gather in the midst of wilderness places and we struggle to find our way. And we remember the teachings of our faith, that we are not the first to wander in the wilderness, that not all who wander are lost but that you meet us there in these wilderness places and form us. And as you guided your people through the wilderness of Sinai and brought them into a new land of Canaan, so you formed them to be your people. That as we as Christians think of our story of Holy Week and the, the wilderness of that time and the upheaval and the violence and when it seemed like all was lost, 
and the one we felt was the Messiah had died, you burst forth a tomb and reminded us that your justice, your mercy, your grace will not be stopped. And in the midst of these times are the times of transition and transformation where your hands form us into being your people. So we bow now in this time to open ourselves to your presence that the hands of your grace, your love, your justice, your peace, your mercy, all those things that make you 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 would work and form into our souls as we seek to be your people. Loving God, in this moment we pause and we lift up those places of struggle in our lives. Open ourselves that we might feel your presence, your word of love and grace as we lift our concerns to you. Loving God, breathe on us breath of God and, and, and fill us with life renewed and anew. That all we do would shine with your light, that we would be your salt, that your hope, your grace, your mercy, your justice would come through us and touch your world and remind them in this wilderness time of your saving power. We pray this humbly in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And he says, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. Why are we here? To be salt. And what would it be like to live that salt life, that life that God wants us to live? What would it look like? And we've explored a whole lot of different things. We've explored grace. It would be a graceful life. It would be a loving life. And we talked about faith. We talked about integrity, that what's on the inside matches with God and that God shines through us. There's a connection and integrity in what we do. We talked about mercy. We talked about humility. We talked about generosity. And as I was thinking of how to wrap this all up, another word came to me, and I'm going to share that with you this morning, and the word is justice. I was thinking about God and justice and Jesus' teachings about it. I want to lift some of those up, especially a very important one this morning. And I was thinking, okay, what kind of salt would that be? Salt is a lot of different things. And one of the things that hit me is that almost in every emergency kit, first aid kit that I've ever seen, there's this little packet that says smelling salts. Smelling salts. We're to be smelling salts. Have you ever smelled smelling salts? Whew! It smells, I think it smells more like ammonia than it does salt. But I got to tell you, it wakes people up. And the idea behind smelling salts is that when people are unconscious, it wakes them up. 
wakes them up to see the world around them and brings them back. I want you to think about smelling salts today. Because the sermon that Jesus is teaching here in the section of Matthew's gospel called the Little Apocalypse is a wake-up sermon. And the Little Apocalypse is about Jesus talking about the end of times and what it will be like and what we're to be about. It's found in Matthew's gospel, chapter 25. I'll be starting with verse 31. And I will be reading it in Peterson's translation, the message. Let us open our hearts that we might hear God's word for us. When he finally arrives, blazing in beauty with all his angels with him, the Son of Man will take place, take his place on his glorious throne. And then all the nations will be arranged before him, and he will sort the people out, much as a shepherd sorts out sheeps, sheep and goats, putting the sheep to his right and the goats to his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Enter, you who are blessed by my father, take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It has been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was homeless, and you gave me a room. I was shivering, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you stopped to visit. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will say, I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you did it to one of these, to something, whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. And then he'll turn to the goats, the ones on his left, and he'll say, Get out of here, worthless goats, for you're good for nothing but the fires of hell. And why? Because I was hungry, and you gave me no meal. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was homeless, and you gave me no bed. I was shivering, and you gave me no clothes. I was sick and in prison, and you never visited. And then the goats are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or shivering or sick in prison and didn't help? And he will answer them, I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you fail to do one of these things to someone who is being overlooked or ignored, that was me. You failed to do it to me. And then the goats will be herded to their eternal doom, but the sheep to their eternal reward. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Enter you who are blessed by my Father. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. Kind of makes you want to be a sheep, doesn't it? Get out of here, worthless goats. You're good for nothing but the fires of hell. Makes you kind of want to be a sheep, doesn't it? That's Jesus' point. What does it look like to be a sheep? What does it look like to be salt? What does it look like to be light? What does it look like to be following Jesus? To be a sheep. What makes a sheep a sheep? I would suggest to you that what makes a sheep a sheep is doing justice. Doing justice. You heard it in the Old Testament prophets this morning. You heard Micah. Thank you for that, Ruth. You heard it from Micah, but it's the very same story that you would hear, the very same word that you hear from Isaiah, Jeremiah, the very same word that you hear from Ezekiel, from Amos, from Hosea. Do justice. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? To love kindness. To walk humbly. Doing justice. Now, I want you to think a little bit about justice this morning, and one of the things I want us to think about right off the top is that most of the time when we talk about judgment in our today world, we're thinking about something called retributive justice. We're talking about punitive justice. And the idea is how do we deal it out? 
How do we punish people to make them change what they're doing? And that's how we tend to look at justice. But that's not the way the Bible looks at justice. And it's important to get the definitions right. When we're talking about justice in the Bible, it's focusing on giving back. It focuses on who was harmed and giving back to the person who was harmed. It's, to it's looking at who was taken away and giving back what was taken away. It's reminding us that we're all created in the image of God. There's a purpose for which human beings were created. Remember we talked about Genesis a few weeks ago? We are created in the image of God. We are created in a way to reflect God's love to the world, and we are sacred and yet we enter in a world where we ourselves have sin and a world that has sin. And that potential that God had been placed in people's lives is taken away, sometimes by the sin that's in within myself as I'm wrestling with addictions or I'm wrestling with bad behavior as I'm wrestling with things within me. Justice is that, 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 that action of God that frees me from that. And in this world outside, there are systemic sins that hold people back from being what God wants them to be. And when we begin to free those people, remind them that they're created in the image of God, remind that they're, they're beloved children of God, we do the works of justice. I love the way Walter Brueggemann words this, uh, the, the uh, Old Testament scholar. Justice, he said, is deciding what belongs to whom and giving it back to them. It's restorative justice. It was Jesus' mission. Remember when Jesus began his ministry, we often talk about this in January, February, in Epiphany, he sits down in the temple and he pulls up the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he reads these words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, for release of the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, for, to let the oppressed go free. You hear the justice. You hear giving back. That's why I'm here makes all the difference in the world. I remember, and I've shared oftentimes, about the poverty simulation that I was in. It was a humbling experience. I thought I knew what it was like to be in poverty until I did a simulation, and I ended up being an Hispanic woman who's all alone with $10 on her dresser with two kids and trying to figure out how she's going to get them to school, take care of all of the things that she needed, and I ended up basically in a shelter within, in the simulation basically two days. I thought I knew, you know, I graduated college, I've got a degree. I mean, I even went to seminary and they gave me a piece of paper that said I mastered being divine. Figure that out. Anyways, but I, I went through all of this thinking I could do this. I couldn't do this. And I really felt even in a simulation, it took my guts out. And I remember coming into the shelter and the chaplain, the pastor, met me there. And I remember her looking at me and she said something to me. What happened? And she sat there and heard my story. Didn't have a lot of money to give me. She gave me the exact same thing that I used to give everybody that came in. You know, I, I give you a coupon for food for 40 bucks. I needed hundreds of dollars to pay bills. But the fact that she treated me as a human being with dignity, with respect, meant all. And I began to realize justice comes in many different ways and how important it is. See, it's not just Jesus' mission. It's the mission for those of us who follow him. It is the salt life. It's what it's about. Think about what the sheep were doing. The sheep were giving back. The sheep were visiting and welcoming the stranger, visiting people in prison and those who were sick, taking care of feeding the poor. They were reaching out to see who had what given away, and they gave it to them. That's the salt life lived. It's the righteousness that exceeds the scribe and the Pharisee. Remember that from last week? Unless your righteousness exceeds the scribe and the Pharisee, remember the scribe and the Pharisees are following laws to make them look good for God. It's about them. That wasn't who it was about for the sheep. The sheep were about the people in need. They saw them. They were awake. And they woke other people up as they reached out to them. Actually, righteousness and justice in the Hebrew are almost the same. The same root. They almost sometimes are used interchangeably. It is the righteousness that exceeds. Do justice. Notice something else. Notice who they were giving to. They were giving to the master. And they didn't realize it. 
Remember a couple weeks ago we talked about incarnation. We believe that our God works incarnately. Now most of the time we talk about that, we talk about that at Christmas. That God comes into the world in the person of Jesus Christ. We say Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. We see God reflected in Jesus. All right? And then when, it, when we were talking about it a few weeks ago, we talked about how the Holy Spirit comes to us and empowers us. Think about it for a moment. God's Holy Spirit just doesn't come to us. God's Spirit is pulling on everybody. That's how John Wesley saw it, our founder. He called it provenient grace. God loves all God's children. God loves all people and is pulling them. I, all, I love Wesley's understanding of evangelism. It isn't beating somebody up and, and dragging them to church. It isn't manipulating what they think. It's realizing that there's a Holy Spirit of God that's lifting those things that are holding them back, working for justice and love and mercy. And our job is to take the barriers out of the way so that the person can rise in the Holy Spirit. I love that image. But if you're looking at that image... And God is with the poor, the needy. Think about the Beatitudes. Blessed, I am with you, are the poor in spirit, or the poor in Luke. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who need to be, you will be comforted. Blessed are those who seek to do what's right. Blessed are the peacemakers, right? It's those who are struggling that God is most with. And so when we reach out to those who are struggling, we are with the God that is with them. We're giving to Jesus. Do we realize that? See, that's the thing. We don't realize it. How well do we treat the stranger, the needy? How well do we treat those around us? And especially in the midst of this year, there are many. Do we see them? Are we awake? Or do we need some smelling salts to do justice, to love kindness? It was one of the things when I was in McKeesport, God woke me up. And sometimes God wakes you up through the poor. I remember one day I was there at, at my, at my, uh, at my uh, uh, parsonage on the, on the porch. A lady came and she needed help. And it was one of my earlier days when I was doing my ministry in the inner city. And I kind of looked at her and I said, look, you know, I, I don't have anything. There's nothing much I can do. And honestly, I didn't. The, the church was locked up. I couldn't get into the food pantry. There wasn't much I could do. And she looked very dejected. She walked away. And I remember coming back into the house and thinking, you know what? I, it, God just didn't let me go. And so I got back in the car, I went out to see her, and I could not find her. And I remember thinking, I just missed an opportunity to help someone in need. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly. You look at the saints, the people who brought salt into the world. One of the ones I love is Mother Teresa. A woman that just had a fire of faith in her belly. And she said, I see Jesus in every human being. And I say to myself, this is hungry Jesus. I must feed him. This is sick Jesus. This one has leprosy. I must wash him and tend to him. I serve because I love Jesus. Notice that. I serve because I love Jesus, not because I think they deserve it. Do you hear the difference? I serve because I love Jesus. Get the idea? That's the salt life. She also said this, by the way, if you're judging people, you have no time to love them. If you're judging people, you have no time to love them. You hear the difference? Notice the difference between the sheep and the goats was not about doctrine. Now, we got a lot of people out there talking about the end of times, and they're going to Revelation, and this is what I think is going to happen, and that's going to happen, and this is going to happen. It's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen on Thursday. It's going to happen here and there. There'll be a thousand years before. There'll be a thousand years after. We got all this different stuff. Well, if you think of that, then I think this, and well, you know, and we get all wrapped up in that. Jesus doesn't deal with any of that. Jesus, it was not about doctrine. It was that they never recognized the master in the needy. And notice it was the entire nations, church included. That's the difference. Do justice, love kindness, and let the rest of it go. Walk humbly with God. That's what Jesus says. Notice also, 
And this is another one that we hear a lot, but I want to, to make this distinction. I think it's important. Notice it was not a matter of calling Jesus Lord. Both sheep and goats call Jesus Lord. They both did. When were we saw you, Master? When did we see you, Lord? It wasn't about calling Jesus Lord. And I hear so much that it's about our, what we say and how much I hear that preached. It's about what we say. As long as I say it, it's enough. But Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7 says just the opposite. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom of heaven, he says in Matthew chapter 7, but those who do the will of my Father. It goes more than just saying a bunch of words. See, I can say that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and my personal Savior and still be racist. I can say, Lord Jesus is my Lord and Savior and be unloving and unkind and unmerciful. I can be abusive and say that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, but I can't follow Jesus and be racist and abusive, right? That's the difference. And that's the righteousness that exceeds the scribe and the Pharisee. That's his confrontation with the church folks. Think about the story of the Good Samaritan. The man comes to Jesus and he's with those people, those who are needy those who are oppressed. He can't have him with those kind of people. I don't know about you, but I hear a lot of those kind of people talk today. If you wear a blue shirt, you can't be with those who have black skin. And if you have black skin, you can't be with those who wear blue shirts. Who made that rule up? Right? He's with them. Let's go test him. Master, what is it that I need to do to find eternal life and salvation? And Jesus says, you read the Bible. You know stuff. What do you know? Well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, is what the church person says. We all know that, right? We learned it in Sunday school. And Jesus turns to him and says, you're right. Now go and do it. And in Luke chapter 10, you, he does what every one of us does. Kind of gives one of these things and goes, but who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of a guy going down a road. Remember that? And he was beaten by robbers and left for dead. And the church people came by and said, you know what, I'm not going to get ready with that kind of person. I'm going to walk by, I'm going to walk by, I'm going to walk by. And it was the Samaritan. The one we think now is a good Samaritan is a nice guy. They were hated by the religious community in their time. It's the one who was on the other side of the tracks that walked over and took care of him and did justice. Visited, took him, took care of him, and gave him back his life. And then Jesus looks at the religious guy who's been judging this guy and says, so who was the neighbor? You hear the doing? Who was the neighbor? And the religious guy goes, the one who showed him mercy. Remember, that's part of the salt life. And Jesus looks at him and says, go and do likewise. That's what it's about, gang. That's what it's about. It's not about learning about salt. It's being salt. It's not believing in salt. It's about being salt. Amen? So how do we wake up? We got a world right now, and I need to tell you, it's bothering me that somehow love and justice and all these things have become political. I'm not saying this to you because I'm a Republican or because I'm a Democrat. I'm not saying this because I'm a communist or a I believe in, in, in some other form, or, or, or I believe in, in capitalism. I'm not saying this because of politics. I'm not saying this because of sociology. I am saying this because these are the teachings of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, if we're going to be worth our salt, we don't give this up. Amen? I don't care whether you're a Republican. I don't care whether you're a Democrat. I don't care who you vote for. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what heritage you have. I don't care what orientation you are. I don't care any of that stuff. What I care is that you understand that there's a way of life that brings life. And the way is easy. To gain the whole world. To put our faith in this. And lose our soul. Amen? This is a time, brothers and sisters, where the church of Jesus Christ need not, best not, do not lose your salt. Amen? I had a closing piece. 
But I think that's pretty much it. You got it, right? So let us go as Christ's body and do justice. Let us love kindness. And let's begin humbly as we open our hearts in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Loving God of salt, of light, breathe on us. Wake us up. Break your word under our noses, in our hearts, and wake up our souls that we may be your people. It is the way that brings life. It's the way that brings life now. It's the way that brings life eternally. Form us this week. That we may be your salt in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we've been given by God a whole new week. And we have a world that is in upheaval. And there is immense pain. We have work to do. And rather than seeing it at work, I see it as a privilege that we get to be and to shine with light, to be salt, to bring life. Because we do not go alone. 
The blessings of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer will be with you, will be with me as we go into the world this week. So let us cross over the barriers to those who are forgotten, who are on the other side, who are struggling with good news. Let us be salt this week. And let all God's children say, Amen. Have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you here next week. God bless.